20 minutes till show time. Feel, feel good. The support went really well. It's probably the best the support's been on the tour, like the best reaction that's got. So I feel like there's even more pressure on me because that went so well. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I feel like once I get the first laugh, I'll be able to relax and be into it. Whereas now I'm just so full of energy, both nerves and excitement. So. It's sort of sinking in now, it's because it's always been so far in the future. Like we booked this so long ago, just at the turn of the year pretty much. So it's always felt like it's so far away and it's never actually going to happen. As soon as the show's finished, I'm going to have a good few pints. Pints of straight vodka through my eye. This has been so big compared to the stuff I was doing last year. So hopefully this time next year, we'll be able to do somewhere even bigger or maybe two nights here. I'm always thinking like that, like, can we, can we do it bigger? Because this never seemed like a possibility. Even when we booked it, I was like, it probably won't be half filled. And the fact that it's been sold out before the night is incredible. So, I'm not thinking too far ahead, I just know that I want to go bigger all the time. Pumped up. Pumped up. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Shane Tom! This is uh, this is this is pretty good. I hope you uh, you don't mind. We're recording this. You might notice there's cameras about. That's obviously so we can stream it to my Asian fan base. <laughs> or uh, or Dong Ling, as he's also known. Just one guy. Not 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 cost effective at all, really. Um, but yeah, thanks uh, thanks for coming. It's not always uh, it's not always like this. Like doing stand up in Northern Ireland. I a couple of months ago got asked to do a, a talk in Ardoin Youth Club, and. Uh, <laughs> It was like, like cross-community, so it was like 50 kids from Ardoin, 50 from the Shankle, and it was a talk on comedy, and a guy phoned me, and he's like, Shane, really want to get you to do this. And uh, I was like, I'm, I'm pretty busy at the minute, and he goes, no, mate, you, you, come on, you can't say no. And I was like, no, nah, I've got a lot of stuff on you, but no, mate, you genuinely can't, can't say no. This is, this is booked, like we've said, we've said you're doing it. And um, I, was like, I was like, maybe I'm a bit nervous about, I've uh, never been in Ardoin before, and... Uh, Obviously, I had to lie to my family about where I was going that night, but I was like, <laughs> I, was like I'll do it. I was like, I'll do it. I'll definitely do it. And uh, it didn't get off to like, the best start because uh, I got my sat nav on the go and uh, started typing in the address in Ardoin. And my sat navs used to like driving around Hollywood and stuff. It was like, my sat nav was like, mate, I don't, I don't know if you, if you want to. And then it sort of switched itself off. It was like playing dead my sat nav was like, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not, going, I'm not going with you. <laughs> so I went, I went up, right? And uh, it was me and Tim McGarry, me and Dad from Get My Head Piece. The kids were about 14 or so, and there was, there was quite a lot of them, as I say, across community. And uh, Tim McGarry was like an absolute god there. Like, they love Get My Head Piece, and especially his character in it. So they absolutely loved him. I was clearly filling in for someone, like someone had... Someone had dropped out because they, they had no idea who I was. And I think a lot of them just thought I was like his son who had come along <laughs> and just stood the whole time by his side. And then they were like, the guys running it didn't even know my name. They were like, <laughs> he goes, right, the wee man's going to speak now. I was like, <laughs> I'll take this one. And I was like, uh, how's it going, guys? My name's, uh, my name's Shane Todd. I do, I do stand-up comedy. And I was going to tell them a bit about like my career and stuff. And one kid appointed himself the uh, the spokesman. He went, uh, "Tell us a joke, mate." And I was like, "Well, traditionally the format of the Q and A session is we do the questions at the end. I was going to talk first." And he goes, "I but tell us a joke, mate." <laughs> and I and I was like, "Well, the thing is, I don't really do jokes. I more do sort of short stories and like real experiences." And he goes, "Well, you, you must be shit, mate, if you can't." <laughs> We're all sitting here thinking he's a comedian, he doesn't do jokes. Tell us joke me to your shit. And I was like, <laughs> he's like, can't get back, tell us joke your shit. And I was like, right, okay. So I was kind of like, you guys asked for it. So I thought, just tell them a one-liner. And 
I was like, okay, guys, I've only ever written one sort of like one line or one some one like punchline sort of joke, so I, I hit them with it. I was like, uh, all right, then, guys, my my cousin asked me to be usher at his wedding during the summer there, but uh, I told him uh, I don't really do impressions <laughs> of of pop stars. And I was like, I was like, and guys, the, the reason that's funny is because, <laughs> let, let, me, let me explain, come back. I was like, there's busy, you can be an usher at a wedding, like it's a role at a wedding. And there, there is also a pop star who, who goes by the name of Usher. So I've sort of acted like I think my cousin thinks. <laughs> I, and, at that st- and the guy, eh, hey, shit. Uh, <laughs> like, hey, shit. But I thought, I thought I could salvage it at that point. It was like, no, nah, I, can, I can bring this back. So sort of like, I just kept talking. I should have left it, but I kept talking. And uh, sort of shot myself in, in the foot a bit. I was, like, uh, I was like, look, guys, as I say, I don't really do jokes. I'm a, I'm a different sort of comedian. I was like, I also make videos as well. So I was like, I do this character. Um, and it's like based on an exaggerated version of somebody like from where I'm from. So I was like, he's really middle class and, and, and rich and arrogant and stuff. <laughs> right, that was also maybe the point I should have stopped. <laughs> That's what I said. And they're all like, because ex- like, they, they thought a comedian just does jokes. So they're, they're pretty interested at this point. And I went, you know, that's what I do. I, I do like the rich middle class character. I went, you guys could do a video. Maybe will you do like a wee spied character? <laughs> I was like, but, and as, as soon as I said it, I was like, oh my God. And then something, something worse happened. They, they don't use the word spied in Ardoin, right? It's a, it's a different adjective for like a wee hood. They say smick, right? So they didn't know this word. So that made it worse because I was like, you guys could do a video where you're like a wee spied. I was like, oh Jesus. And then the same guy went, what's a spied, mate? <laughs> and I was sort of looking at Tim McGarry for help. I was like, how can I say this without just going? <laughs> all, all of you, not not me, all of you guys. Um, but no, and I, I think like I think it was a cross community event. I'm, I'm, as far as I know, like I kind of solved the troubles that night because both because <laughs> because both sides agreed I should I should fuck off. Like they were both like, get get out. I, that's not, and that, that's not like the scariest thing that's happened with, with stand-up. I, I did a, a video a couple of months ago, and I was taking the piss out of political parties in Northern Ireland, and being a, being a performer, you, you sort of do want to get feedback on your work, like it's, it's, it's important that you get that, and I put a video up taking the piss out of the, the DUP, and I got this uh, death threat, essentially, um, <laughs> a very, yes, a very two, 2015 death threat, came via Facebook private message, but... <laughs> We still took it pretty seriously in the Todd camp. Like we were still, we were still pretty worried. And I got a this this. I just got a I just got a private message on like my comedy account. And this guy, fair enough. He he didn't. He was just let me know he didn't like it. He said, "Hi Shane, just want to say didn't find the video very funny. And um, I will find you and shoot you in the head." He was like, "I will." And I was pretty, I was obviously pretty worried by this, um, but I was like, it's only a Facebook message, it'll be fine. And I went down to my dad's house to tell him about it. And uh, my dad sort of freaked out. He was like, what have you done about this? What have you, what, like, what have you done? Has this just happened? And I was like, yes, calm down. Of course, I've, I've, I've done the right thing. I've reported it. Because there's actually an option on Facebook where you can go, you know, I, I don't want to see this. You, I don't want to see that. Don't, don't show me that in the future. You're like, no, I don't want to. And that kind of, that, after that, like, I was like, well, there's obviously nothing to worry about. The guy's been reported. Got a message from the, the Facebook admin team. Zuckerberg and the boys were, were pretty quick on it, being like, uh, Shane, don't worry, two-week account suspension for that guy. So, <laughs> good luck playing Farmville. That's right, you can't. <laughs> and we, we were able to, as a couple of days went by, it, it, it became a bit sort of more lighthearted. I was laughing about it, and we were able to see via the guy's profile that the very specific area of Belfast he lived, right? And uh, my cousin Helen's boyfriend, Danny, is from that exact area. And we were out for a family meal. This was maybe like a week later. And my dad suddenly remembered this. And my dad had taken like a screenshot of the message. And we're eating a meal and it's all very quiet. 
and my dad suddenly remembers, and he's like, Danny, Danny, come here, and, come here and see this. Now, at this point, my dad had gone from being terrified about this to being really proud. He was like, Shane's at a level in his career where people are trying to kill him. I was like, I don't know if that's good. Like, I don't know if that's a good thing. And my dad called, called Danny around the, the dinner table in the restaurant we were in, and he was like, um, this, is a, this is a guy who's trying to shoot Shane in the head. And... Danny's like a very serious, very quiet guy, like really well-mannered. I've, I've known him for a long time, but I've never really shared a joke with him. So I knew I could rely on him for like an honest answer. And my dad was like, Danny, do you recognize that guy? And Danny took the phone. I, was, I got a bit nervous. It made it feel a bit more real at this point. And I looked at Danny and he looked at the message and he looked at me and he looked at the message and he looked at me and everyone's watching us at this point. And he went, uh, do you actually recognize him? That's, that's one shot Seamus, we'll call him. <laughs> I was like, huh? And everyone was like, oh shit, this is like a real threat. And then after about, he like went back and sat in the seat. And after like three or four minutes, he went, I just want to say, I was only joking. I, 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 have, I have no idea. I've never seen that person before. I was just, just having a joke. And I was like, for sure, don't wait six to seven years to reveal your style of banter, you absolute lunatic. Like don't, you can't suddenly be hosting episodes of Punk. Like you can't just all of a sudden do, do that in a very serious, uh, serious thing. As, speaking of situations where you should like just say nothing, I was uh, I was in Edinburgh doing the, the Fringe Festival this year, and I was renting a flat that was up for sale while I was while I was there. So people were coming in to do viewings, and the guy who owned it was just like, uh, when someone comes in, just like hang out uh, in in the living room and, and keep your head on or whatever. So I just stayed in the background, and after a while, like I was just up at the Fringe by myself, and I heard a, a family come in to see the place, and I heard the like mother of the family talking, and I recognised her accent as being from Northern Ireland, and I like bounded over to her and I was like uh, I was like in the kitchen and I was like oh my god you're from you're from Northern Ireland and she was like yeah yeah she's a bit sort of like freaked out and I was like no it's just it's been so long like the accent and stuff and it just reminds me it was the third day of the fringe it was like oh no it's just ah tell tell me about the green grass what's it like still is it still half decent and she's like yeah still all right and um she, she was like, yeah, I'm, I'm from Northern Ireland, but I was that excited, I didn't let her do much talk, and I was like, whereabouts are you from? And she said, oh, I'm from Port Stewart, and I was like, if you're from Port Stewart and you're at the Fringe, now, there's other people in the house, like members of her family were there, I was like, if you're from Port Rush and you're at the Fringe, definitely go and see Jim Owen, uh, he's an Irish comedian who's based in Australia for a long time, he's world class, he does all the festivals, he's amazing, he's actually, I did a TV thing with him, he was such a nice guy, and she was looking at me being like, mate, like, don't speak. Because at that exact moment, what it turned out was just actual Jim Owen was in the house. Like, he's, he's like her brother, so he was just also in, in, in viewing the house. And he heard all this, and at that exact moment, he, like, just craned his head round the doorway and looked at me, and I was like, that is the actual man that I'm... <laughs> that I'm gushing about here. And uh, because I kind of know him just a bit, like, just a tiny bit, he was like, what, uh, what, what, what were you saying about me there? And I was like... Oh, just you're a hero and stuff, and uh, and then I, I sort of got to thinking. I was like, is this like a magical house? Like, if I just say people's names, will they just arrive in this living room? Like, that would have been really handy as a kid. If I had known that, I could have been like, Dad, come back. <laughs> that's not that's not true. My dad didn't my dad didn't leave my family. I I did that joke in Edinburgh quite a bit, and one night. Yeah, sort of, like, comedy's going well. One night when I was playing at the Fringe, it was just two American lads and my dad as my, were, were my audience. And I, I did that bit, and then, obviously, like, I'm only joking. And then I said to them later on, and I said, I was like, my dad's actually in tonight when I was talking about him. And they, because I hadn't told them it was a joke, they were just looking at him being like, what, a, he's just come back into his life now at this point. <laughs> just because he's playing the Fringe, like, he just... <laughs> jumping, on the, jumping on the cash bandwagon. Um... So, yeah, I, uh, this is, as I say, it's not always like this. Like, this is great. I did, I did warm-up for uh, the Nolan show last year, which was sort of always been a comedy dream, like, to uh, <laughs> get, the, get to that point. Like, if, if there's a serious debate show going on, I like to be doing 15 minutes of jokes beforehand. Like, that's really where, where I want to be. If you, if you don't know what the Nolan show is, like, I always explain it to people when I'm gigging in other places. I'm like, uh, they just take every person in Northern Ireland that's certified as mental, put, put, put them in a big room and just mention a really controversial subject and then they walk away, they're like, discuss that. Discuss that amongst yourselves. 
So, so yeah, I was pretty nervous about doing warm up for it. There was like 200, 300 people there. It was in the, the BBC studios, and I was nervous on my way there. And a girl from BBC met me in reception, and she was like, Shane, I'm going to show you up to the green room, and that's where all the, the acts relax beforehand, so you can get a, a tea or a coffee and, and, and just relax. And I was like, that's great, thank you so much. And just before I went in, I was like, I was really early. It, it tapes at like 10.40 on a Wednesday, and I was there at like 9 on, on the Tuesday. I was like, <laughs> a, a serial killer on amount of time early, like really. No, I, was, I, was, I was there like an hour early, and, and she said, um, just want to let you know, Shane, you're a bit early there's a super fan already in, in the green room, so just kind of like ignore him, pretend he's not there or whatever. Now, I, I should have realized with hindsight, hindsight is a great thing, that he was a super fan of the band Spandau Ballet who were performing on the show that night, but I very quickly jumped to the conclusion that because there was nobody else there, I was like, well, this is the start of it. I was like... <laughs> and she was like, she was like, so you want me to walk in? I was like, pretty sure I got it from here, Sandra. She's like... I, I'm not called Sandra. I was like, I don't need to worry about things I like got anymore. <laughs> got it. Got it. Uh, went in and um, went in, pretty big room, tea, coffee, all that sort of thing, buffet laid out. And there was just one sort of middle aged guy sitting in the corner, loads of stuff waiting to be signed and a few Sharpies and stuff. And he looked pretty nervous. And I suddenly got like ultra confident. I was like, flip, here we go. And uh, I walked in and he sort of mumbled a hello at me. And I was like, because he's facing the other way, he obviously doesn't know who, who he's talking to. So I was like, how's it going, mate? And uh, he turned around very quickly and, and then looked away. And I was like, well, naturally, he's nervous around, uh, ar <laughs> around the big dog here. So, um, so I thought, like, make something of this experience. Like, it's the uh, first time I've encountered a super fan. It's first time he's, he's met his hero. So I, like, let a bit of tension gather. I was, like, just showing him that, like, buffets are nothing to me at this point. I was like... Left in a grape, it looked like I was going to eat it, and then I was like, yeah, just it. <laughs> The annoying thing was that I threw it straight into a bin, so it looked like I was just being considerate, but I was like, I took another one, just completely missed that. I was like, yeah. so, so I rolled my level, and um, he, he sort of looked around at me, and uh, I thought, well, let's engage him in a bit of chat, let's find out his, his story and his sort of relationship with me, and uh, I was like, the bubble very quickly burst, I was like, what was the, the first show you ever, uh, you ever came to? Here you're a, a bit of a super fan. What was the, the first gig you were ever at? And the guy looked at the stuff he wanted to be signed and he was like, uh, Birmingham 84, definitely Birmingham 84. I was like, well, I was born in 88, mate, so I don't know how you're working, <laughs> how, how you're working that out for a super fan. And also, why do you want me to sign all those Spandau Ballet albums? What's the link? I don't know what the link is. I, I'm a massive fan of, of Nolan Live and the reason I like it is because because of the gear change that happens near the end of the show, like it's obviously, yeah, you've seen it's a serious debate show that can be talking about a lot of issues, but there's a musical guest, and it doesn't always, they don't always compliment each other, like you'll have some, some woman on, like a mother of four, and she's telling you about like a horrendous ordeal where her whole family got rabies in, in Bundoran in the 90s. <laughs> on a holiday, just wiped them all out, like, oh, all, all dead, like she's, she's the main guest, and, and she's, she's talking to Nolan and she's like telling him this tragic story and at, at, at like a, it's getting towards the end of the show and, and, and you're hinging on her every word and a tear forms in the corner of her eye and just starts to move down her cheek. But before it can get there, Nolan gets a wee word in his ear that the musical guests are ready. So he's like listening to her and he's very attentive. And then all, all of a sudden he hears it and he's like, I'm sorry kid, I'm gonna have to stop you there. Ladies and gentlemen, with his head single wagon wheel, the country music sensation, <laughs> give it up for Nathan Carter and before, before that tear reaches her, reaches her jaw, Nathan's on stage just belting it. Culture's like everyone loving it. She's, she's still crying. Like she is very emotional. Like everyone but her just loving it. I, uh, and I think, I think they missed a trick the night of the sort of flag protest episode a couple of years ago. Like uh, I'll say like tensions were pretty high and there was like rows in the studio and there was fights and people were getting very, very annoyed. Uh, and there was no musical guest on that, but I think what would have been great is just uh, towards the, the end of it when some guy's screaming in Nolan's face, he's like, Stephen, they've taken my identity, it's a disgrace. And Nolan just was like nodding, and he went, I'm going to have to stop you there, ladies and gentlemen. They're back on the comeback trail with a new single. Give it up for the cheeky girls, huh? <laughs> Get on here. Just a boy sitting there raging. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Trick. I'm, I'm from a place uh, just outside Belfast called Hollywood, and... Uh, it's a pretty, pretty good time to be, to be from Hollywood. You've got uh, a lot of guys kind of doing pretty well for themselves. You've got 
Rory McIlroy, probably the you know the number one athlete in the world at the minute. You've got uh, Jamie Dornan, possibly most talked about actor in the world in the last year. And uh, yeah, we'll save it because uh, recently <laughs> I no, I'm just gonna. You might want to hear what this third guy's achieved. Um, <laughs> Tuesday of last week, Bob and Fernando's two qualify for the free starter, so. <laughs> the three amigos, a lot of people call us, like a lot. <laughs> Me, Rory and Jamie, like a lot of people call us that. Like I don't, I never ask people specifically to call us that and sort of insist, but people just off the, cause like, Three guys sort of traveling the world, doing pretty, pretty well for themselves. Uh, just three equally good friends. Like not, like, you know, you've got one best friend in life. It's very rare you find like, you know, three thirds just sort of perfectly. I'm sure like you'll, you'll be familiar with uh, Jamie's show, uh, Jamie Dornan, by the way, I'm a close personal friend. Um, you'll be familiar with Jamie's show, The Fall, which, which films in, in Belfast. and. I, I really, it's like a dark, you, you know what I'm talking about, it's like a dark, gritty BBC drama that sort of leaves you on the edge of, on the edge of your seat. And because it films like quite near where, where I live, I and a lot of people, like you might watch it in a very different way because you're, you're getting to experience the dark drama and you get gripped by the intensity, but you also simultaneously get to play the game of, do I, do I know where that, look, do I, like do I, have I been there before? Like you're like, mm. so the, the way that gets played out is like you might have a guy watching it in London He's watching the BBC be there, and, and he's like, maybe the guy's girlfriend's in the next room, and he's describing the action to her, like how, how dark and gritty it is. He's trying to give her a sense of it, and he's watching it there, and it's a, it's a scene where, like, Dornan's, like, following some woman up an alleyway, and, and he's, like, put his hood up and stuff, and the guy's like, oh, my God, you've got to get in here and see this. He's right. Y y yes, he's spent a bit of time in Australia, this guy, right? He's like, <laughs> correct. Oh. So he, he's like, oh, my God, you've got to get in here. He's... He <laughs> He's right behind this woman. Oh my God, oh my God, he's right behind her. Whereas you'll get the same scene. You'll get a guy watching in Belfast, his girlfriend's in the next room. And the guy will be like, oh my God, you've got to get in here and see this. He's right behind this woman. Oh my God, he's right behind her. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Is that the swimmers we go to? <laughs> Come on. Back of the net. Yes, he has. Reminds it. Ah, oh, yes, he has killed her. He's murder he has brutally, <laughs> brutally murdered her there. Outside where I got the Veruca in 97, was it? <laughs> good vending machines in that leisure centre. Good, good vending machines, good vending machines. Good vending machines. I, I also like the way that uh, the one Fifty Shades of Grey came out. Like a lot of, a lot of like, lads were asking their mates. They were like, uh, here, would you, ever, like, would you ever get into that? Like S&M sex, like, would you ever get into that now? Personally, I've never seen Fifty Shades of Grey because it would be very difficult to watch one of your best friends like, like that. You'd be like... <laughs> You under, you, well, I was going to say you understand, you wouldn't understand, but trust me, I was like, I don't want to say that. And um, the, I just got to tell you, like, I, I remember uh, reading an article in, in a newspaper, I was having breakfast with my parents, and I, I remember reading an article about S&M sex, and it, it terrified me because it sort of said that uh, th this couple in, in Scotland were having S&M sex for the first time, they'd been married for like 30 years, and the husband was like up in a noose, right? And um, he basically agree to safe word with his wife beforehand. They've done a bit of research that if he started to just die or whatever, um, at some point, like vaguely die, he could tell her this word and she would know to like get him down or whatever. And I remember reading this article and, and sort of thinking like, I couldn't do that because, and I said to my parents, I was like, guys, the, the reason that I would never get in, just get into that world is because if, if, that was, if that was me, and I was like, I was a kid reading this, but I was like, if that was me with like, my future wife, and I was up in, a, up in a noose, and I, during that, I felt myself starting to casually die, and, and I wanted to live, I, I like to think in that situation, what might work as well as a safe word, if I'd forgotten it, would be the use of the phrase, I've, I've genuinely forgotten the safe word here. <laughs> like, I've... Excuse me, just one sec. I, I for the life of me can't, oh God, that is tight. I, I, I don't know how to say this to you without you thinking I'm doing like a thing here, but I, I don't know that word I told you that is gonna save my life. Is there any chance? I mean, ideally you would just understand I am actually dying. 
and just let me down, just maybe even this once, first time we've done it, just marshmallows, I know it's not, I'm panicking, give me a second. <laughs> I know it's not. And I was like, I just said to my parents, that's why, and they were like, yeah, fair enough, no one's, no one's, no one's forcing you apart from your Uncle Colin. So, um, it's true, that's true. But what I, uh, what, what I like is the way, the way other stuff films here, like Game of Thrones filming in, in Northern Ireland has, has been great for the country, and not just for the economy, like I think the best thing about it is like the way it's filtered into like everyday life, and a good example of this is like fights on nights out. Have sort of, because of the battle scenes in that, like they've become a wee bit more sort of like epic, and a wee bit more, you know, the, the lads are sort of doing it on a bigger scale now, they're not just having a sort of a scrap in Shaftesbury Square, like there's a bit more uh, choreography to it and stuff, like, uh, you know, you're coming out of Lavery's at like one in the morning or whatever, and before this you would have had like two groups of lads just run at each other and just start like having a big scrap. But now that they've like seen Game of Thrones, it's a bit different. Like one crowd of lads, like uh, they'll, they'll have a leader or whatever. And just before, like obviously he'll, he'll, he'll stop the boys just before they're going to run into this other group. And he'll sort of like just give them like words of wisdom, kind of just a bit of a speech. He'd be like, gentlemen, take a knee there. And the boys will, boys will just go down, <laughs> just go, go down in front of them. And he'll sort of like stride around. He'd be like, now nah, obviously we all know what's happened here. These, uh, these boys have committed the cardinal sin of uh, spilling an alcohol pop in Dean's shirt here. <laughs> Dean is raging, like Dean's, Dean's, Dean's gone home, right? <laughs> he just got that. He just got that. And um, like everyone's horrified at what the atrocity that's taken place and like everyone knows action has to be taken. And uh, the guy will just, he'll just get like, just because of Game of Thrones, just a wee speech before they go into battle and he'll be like, boys, I just, uh, just want you to remember this. Uh, a moment in defeat is merely a, and this guy hasn't seen Game of Thrones, he's just come in, just killed, <laughs> just instantly smacked this guy in it. And even like his own, his own mates are like, what, what are you doing? He's like, I haven't seen Game of Thrones. He's like, I've never, I'm so sorry, mate. I've never seen it. <laughs> Fuck's sake. He's like, we meant that, we, I got it in planner there, but we did, we did Mad Men first ever. Fuck's sake. Always meant that, you know what I mean? Always meant to do it, but I never got round to, ah, oh, fuck. I'm so sorry, mate. This, guy, this, guy, this guy's dead. He's, he's, he's been fell by, by Brother Anto of House Council. Just this, this giant here. I, I, did, some, I did some shows in, in London recently, which was, which was great to be doing stand-up in, I'll say, different places. I'm keen to sort of travel and, and do it in different places, but... It, it went well, like I, I didn't expect to sell out a gig there, like I didn't expect, you know, 20 people, never mind 17. And um, <laughs> I shouldn't have done it in the Hammersmith Apollo, that was, that was an odd venue choice, there wasn't much of an atmosphere, but I, yeah, I did a gig in London, it was mainly people from home that had, that had come over and after the gig I was chatting to some of my like, English mates and, and a guy from home came over in the, in the pub beside the venue and he was like, Shane, just want to say... I'm from, I'm from back home and it's great to see a guy like you doing it on the international stage. It was like 40 minute flight. I was like, I didn't say that. I was like, yes. Mr. Worldwide. <laughs> flight home's at nine. Tomorrow I'll be home for a late breakfast, but yes. <laughs> and uh, he was like, uh, he was like, no, I just think it's great because, you know, I've followed you since the start and you're, you, you know, you're, you're doing it in bigger places now. And I was like, thanks so much. And he goes, nah, really enjoyed it. And I was like, that's great. And then the bubble kind of burst a wee bit. I was like, maybe I can, I can do this regularly. I can travel. And, and I was talking to my mates and they were like, that's great. And then the same guy came back. And this is when the, the illusion was sort of shattered. He came back over and he was like, Shane, I'm, I'm really sorry, mate. Just got just to gotta ask you this. Are you flying back to uh, Northern Ireland tomorrow? And I was like, yeah, I'm on the, on the first flight out. And he, he opened like a wee satchel he had with him. And he took out like a plastic bag and he was like, if my mate met you at the airport, <laughs> would you be able to meet up with him and give him, if I give him your number, like would you be able to give him this t-shirt he left my house? And I was like, at that point, I, I realized that people had realized that it was cheaper to buy a ticket from my show than to pay standard packaging costs on a Royal Mail package. I was like, all right, mate, big fan. Oh yeah, good stuff. So, I mean, I'm in Glasgow next week. So if anyone's looking at anything taken over, if, I've got a van for the Stena line, so just by all means, give me a shout. Fast forward five years, uh, I'm on an episode of Banged Up Abroad doing my South American tour, being like, <laughs> just thought they were fans, mate. Just, just honestly thought they were fans. But uh, here's, here, when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm in London, when I'm like on public transport, like we do it differently here. Like when we're on like the Ulster bus, it's different than 
the tube in Russia or like they don't interact as much as we do and everyone sort of keeps to themselves. So I just always have headphones in when I'm on the tube and when I was there, like literally last week, uh, it was just the start of the Halloween break and this like really old eccentric man came up to me and uh, dressed in like a three-piece suit, um, really, really camp and he, he tapped me on the shoulder and I thought maybe he's looking direction somewhere else and um, I took my earphone out and I was like, hiya. And it's the first person to ever speak to me on the tube. And I was like, maybe he just has an interesting story to tell. And the guy went, uh, I took my headphone out and he went, should you not be at school, son? <laughs> and I was like, I'm, I'm 27, mate. I'm, t <laughs> I'm 27. Uh, but I was like, that's kind of a bit of a boost. Maybe he thinks I look young. And then he, he sort of ruined it by going, as if that wasn't creepy. He, he said to me the creepiest thing anyone's ever said. He went, uh, can I just ask? What parent did you get that top lip from? <laughs> now I know I've got exceptional lips, but I was like, that's the, like, that just, I just had a shower straight away as soon as I got back with that guy. Like, I, like, he, he, he's my husband now. Like, I'm, I'm at 75, but he's, he's, he's a nice, he's a nice, he's a nice guy. Um, but when I, when I, when I came back home this time, I, I came home to the news that, uh, a 15-year-old that hacked into the Talk Talk database and, and given like, do you know what? No, that's what I'm going to say, right? Uh, somebody weighed there, wait, wait, right? See, in Northern Ireland, right? The reaction to that, like, we will claim, and like, we'll, <laughs> we, will t we will welcome, as soon as we know there's a slight link we're here, we're like, come on in, right? And <laughs> when you weigh, right, I had exactly the same reaction. I was watching that news story. And I was watching in the airport as soon as he got to Belfast City Airport, 24 hour news camera screen, and I was like, he did what? I was like, that's terrible. He should, he should definitely go to jail for that. He's from where? Good man. Good man. My, my, my attitude totally, that's a guy there. He, he didn't pay for tickets and ticket master. That guy just he like knew how to get in. But straight, straight away, when I, when I read about that guy, I was like, uh, my attitude totally changed because you look for a spin on you're like, oh, it's great to see, you know, young people getting involved in the IT industry. Um, <laughs> great to see him. Like, I have no doubt by Christmas that guy will be, do that kid will be doing like, uh, you know, broadband ads with Frostbit Boy. Like, he'd be, <laughs> he's like, he's like the new darling of the country. He's like, oh, God, you wouldn't belong going to McGabry. Oh, God. You wouldn't. You wouldn't. <laughs> you wouldn't. You wouldn't belong having non-consensual sex in the showers of McGalbury. You wouldn't. You wouldn't belong having a breakdown because you weren't used to all this attention. Um, my my brother's like the same age as that guy. My brother's on the computer every day, and I thought like maybe my brother could do something like that. And then I remember that like the last time I like listened in on him, sort of playing his computer, he was playing Call of Duty, and he had the the headset on. He was talking to his mates and. It was actually really impressive, so I thought maybe he could be up there. He was like talking to them about like their strategy. He was like, right guys, I've got the perimeter secured, and we're gonna go in in a group of four, and two you bring up the flanks. And I was like, God, he knows what he's talking about. And then he ruined it. He's like, but hold the fort for a second, guys. Listen, I'm going for a wee, and then <laughs> there's a potential chance I'm getting a bowl of Cocoa Pops, but when I get back, <laughs> we're storming this castle. Uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't as good. Um, this, this show is called Sick Bro, and it's because uh, about a year ago, I, I got really ill. I, I got my appendix taken out. And if you ever get your appendix taken out, yeah, just loving it. This guy <laughs> absolutely loves it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, got my, I got my appendix taken out. If you ever had that done, like, you should recover within like three to four days. You should get better. And it was like a week later, and I, I wasn't getting better, and I, I knew there was something seriously wrong. And I actually, after like a week, I was getting worse, and I was pretty much bed bound and couldn't like move a muscle. I'd got the stitches in my side and I was like feeling really, really bad. And just where I was going to like ask someone to take me to hospital, I got, a, I got a phone call and it was a producer from BBC Northern Ireland. And I was like, he's like, Shane, I want to talk to you about a job. And I was like, you think what I'm thinking? The Three Amigos on the Road, the documentary? <laughs> Following the boys on the worldwide tour, just like in a, in a camper van, drop us in some country with like 20 quid. See what we get up to. He's like, no, that's a, no, that's a different department. We're not, no, that's not what it is. And it was a guy from uh, CBBC, and he's like, Shane, if you want to do a week of acting work, I, I saw you got your appendix out, so you put something on Twitter about it, but like, are you fit now? And I was like, you know, obviously going to say to him, like, no, I, I think I might be dying a bit, but when he, 
But when he said 70 quid for a week's work, I was like, no, I'm feeling a bit better. I was like, I'm, 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 I'm good to go. And he's like, it's a week of acting work. You won't need to talk or do anything. Um, and and you know, you'll get the money in your account in a week. And I was like, that sounds great. And I remember saying to my mom, I was like, I'm just gonna have to do it. So like my family like helped me into my car and I just drove to, <laughs> dro drove to do this. And it was filming in Killy Lake Castle. And it was a show called Danny's Castle. And I, I realized it was for CBBC when the, the director, he sort of met me at, at, at reception and he was like, he had like a yo-yo. He's like a, <laughs> and like a, a funny beer can hat, but it was like Coke and Diet Coke. He was like a, I knew it was CBBC because he was like a wacky sort of character. He was about 47, right? And um, <laughs> I was out writing and I introduced myself. I was like, I'm Shane Todd. I'm here to do a week's film. And now by this point, I'd lost three stone, right? And whenever you're starting at six, that's not ideal. So uh, I, I, I said to him, I was like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Shane Todd. And he said, uh, you're here to do a week, of, a week of acting. And I was like, yeah. And he said, well, in that case, mate, I hope you like space hoppers. <laughs> and I was like, is that related to what we're going to be doing? I, I, didn't, I didn't tell him. I just had my appendix out and, and was very much on the verge of dying. So I was just like, I was like, yeah, I love him. Uh, so he was like, you're, you're going to be in a space opera for the entire week of film and bouncing around the castle. Now, what I'm about to, I should at that point been like, no, I actually think I'm dying, mate, I shouldn't do this. But I was like, 70 quid, thinking of, thinking of the 70 quid. This, this show is on iPlayer, it's on BBC iPlayer, right? So this isn't me exaggerating this, you can just go home and see the evidence of what I'm about to tell you, right? The show's, the show's called Danny's Castle, right? And um, we, we got on there, and uh, the role I was playing was like a, dead ghost goth rock star who's, yes, yeah, like a scary, I'm like bouncing around on a big, I've got like a space hopper and I'm just bouncing around this castle, sort of oh, really scaring people and yeah, it's a pretty, pretty sweet role and um, I, didn't, I didn't need to say anything and I was wearing so much white makeup you couldn't tell I was ill and uh, I, did it, I did it for a week and I was like, well on the Friday I can just go to, go to hospital like and um, it was the, obviously, and it was the it was the last day of filming and the director called me and I had like 20 minutes to go till I was done. And the director was like, Shane, everyone's been really impressed by, like we knew you could act. We didn't know you could combine acting with, with, with space hopper and like that. Like no one knew, <laughs> don't think anyone knew that was possible, but you've done it. And I was like, thanks a lot. And he goes, before, before you go, we just want to make sure we get the, the, big, the big shot. And I was like, what is the big shot? And he was like, do you know the big spiral staircase when you came in, mate? And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm one step ahead of you. I was like, you want me to go down that? He's like, yeah. So I was like, high five. So it's the last day. I, um, I was thinking, well, I can just bounce down the staircase and then keep bouncing to A&E. I was like, I can, because I was that good at it, I, could, I could, could have got there at the same speed of a car. So I was like, I'll just, I'll just go to the hospital after this and tell them I'm dying. So I start my descent on the stairs. My side still very, very sore, still very raw. I hadn't told them anything was wrong with me. And as I start my descent down the stairs, I took off with far too much enthusiasm. Like I, I was heading down very, very quickly. And the director, as I was going down, just shouted, Shane, when you get near the bottom to the camera that was pointing up from the bottom of the stairs, he goes, do like a face, right? And so I noted that. But at that exact moment, to stop myself from like literally falling straight into the camera, I pulled myself back very quickly. And about seven of my 10 stitches came out, right? And when I said I did a face <laughs> to the camera, I really did a face to the camera. Like it was the best face you've ever, because they didn't know what had happened. And then when I landed at the bottom, they were like, you're like the Daniel Day-Lewis of, <laughs> of space hopper actors, they said. With, with their eyes, right? They were like, that is, that is unbelievable. So you can, you, can, you can watch that. And then I just, I just bounced, off the, bounced off the hospital and I was like, hi, uh, uh, Shane Todd, I did a birth. I was like, 1968, what's the problem? I was like, oh no, I'm, I'm pretty close to death here. Um, space opera in my hand. I was like, no. I'm... And uh, they were like, okay, well, we'll do, some, we'll do some blood tests. So I did some blood tests. Doctor called me into his office and he was like, uh, Shane, uh, I'm going to tell you something here. You know, we took your appendix out last week. And I was like, yeah, I definitely remember. <laughs> Actually, while we're here, could you do anything about that? He's like, whoa. <laughs> He's like, put your shirt down. So I was like, uh, yeah, just don't feel great. And he was like, Shane, remember we took your appendix out? I said, yeah. He went, 
We didn't need to, mate. That's not what the issue was. And I was like, are you essentially saying you did that for banter? And he was like, <laughs> is it? Yeah, what kind of, what kind of did? And he said, now, Shane, what I'm, what I'm about to tell you here, I don't want you to freak out. And I was like, for sure, when a doctor says that, don't freak out, you're gonna freak out. And he was like, I'm gonna, based on these test results, I'm gonna diagnose you with something. Now it's not gonna affect you. We're just gonna give you antibiotics in hospital for a week and then you're good to go. But you've got a thing called Crohn's disease. And he's like, the way that's gonna affect you is he's like, do you know your immune system? And I was like, yeah, he went, you don't have that anymore. He's like, <laughs> he's like that's one thing you don't need to worry about because you don't have it. And I was like, should not worry more about it. He's like, yeah, pro you, sh yeah you probably should, <laughs> probably should. And he got really serious. He's like, look, you're going to be absolutely fine and about a year on and I'm 100%. And he said to me at the time though, he got really close to me and there was complete silence. And he said, Shane, I just want to say though, based on these results, if you had have kept going the way you were going, I was terrified at this point. He goes, if you had have kept going and we hadn't have brought you in, there is a high chance that you might have, and I was so scared I finished the sentence. I was like, died. And, <laughs> and he was like, well, fainted. Um, <laughs> It's like, it was like potentially fainted. Like in the next, in the next three to four years, you might have, at some point, fallen over a bit, but you would have been, you would have been fine. So, so I, I went in the hospital for a week uh, in 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 the city hospital. Immediately befriended a male Filipino nurse, right? And uh, don't know why that's funny. Every gig, don't know why. Don't know why that gets a laugh. Don't know why that gets a laugh. But it was like, it was like an old person's ward I was in, right? And uh, they were just like, we've got no other space, so you're gonna go in there. And this guy wasn't used to sort of chatting to people too much, but he was like a real, real big guy, real big fat guy. And I was like, I just have a bit of crack with him. He seems nice. And after a while, he was like, uh, he goes, well, whereabouts are you from? And I was like, Hollywood, Three Amigos. <laughs> and he's like, no, I don't know what that is. Uh, I was like, well, whereabouts are, whereabouts are you from? And he said, I'm originally from the Philippines. And I was like, oh, that's amazing. Like, your English is, is amazing. And for some reason, I don't know why I said this, I was like, uh, like the boxer, Manny Pacquiao, he's from the Philippines. And he got really excited, I knew that. That's like his national hero. And he was like, yes. And he was so buzzing. And I don't know why I said this, kind of like having like dad banter. I was like, because he was like a big guy. I was like, and are you like the second best boxer in the Philippines? And while, whilst his English was 100%, he didn't really have banter yet. Like he was sort of, <laughs> like he had like a GCSE level banter. Like he wasn't, he could probably read it, but he wasn't, com <laughs> like he didn't have the Rosetta Stone tape yet for, for, ba for banter, right? So whenever I was like, are you the second best boxer in the Philippines? The guy just took this totally literally. And he was like, no, I, I work here. Full time. I'm. I'm. I'm a nurse. Like I, I. I. I work. I work here. I wouldn't have time to. He's like that. That's our national sport. I definitely wouldn't be. Probably even the top hundred th thousand. I don't. I mean, I'm reasonably fit because um, I'm a feed all day and stuff. And I was like, no, nah, I don't really think you're the second best boxer in the Philippines. And he, he looked at me like, yeah, you did. He was like, all right. Is that like, we need to change his medication? We need uh, there's something there's something wrong there, and um, and I was sort of uh, you know in, in, in enjoying his we we got uh, to know each other as, as it went on. He was he was really good laugh in the end, and after a couple of days since I'd been in hospital, my dad hadn't had a chance to visit me yet because he'd been on on a holiday for 24 years, and uh, <laughs> that's not that's not true. <laughs> He'd been, he'd been getting milk for 24 years. Uh, so so he, 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 he came up to see me and, and he wanted me to feel better. Now, I was just literally getting antibiotics for a drip. You can need surgery with this thing and stuff, but they were like, trust me, we'll just give you antibiotics and then you're totally fine, right? And I was like, that's great. So when I was speaking to my dad, I was like, there's nothing to worry about. I'm, I'm 100%, I'm, I'm actually fine. And then... Um, my dad came up anyway, and he clearly like practiced his speech in the car on the way there to make me feel better, make me feel a wee bit taller and stuff. And he, he came in, and I was lying on the bed, and he didn't like 
start with any conversation. He just went straight into the... He's, not, he's very much a man's man, right? But he went straight into it. He just walked up to my bed, held my hand, just got right close to my face, and he went... Bigger. <laughs> and I was like, yep, yeah, lost a lot of weight. Plan is to eventually get bigger. And he went... Stronger. <laughs> and I was like, yep, yeah, hope, hope, hope so. Faster. And I was like... On the way in the car there, he definitely heard the Kanye West song, Bigger, Stronger, Faster. Like, 100% that had, like, subconsciously influenced what he was saying. But then, at that point, he, like, ran out of adjectives, but he wanted me to still feel like he didn't feel his work was done. So he kept just saying words that didn't really apply in any way to my situation. He was promising me things he couldn't deliver. He was, like, taller. <laughs> younger. We're going to get, tell him, we're going to... Looking at the nurses, he's like, we're going to get this guy younger when he comes out of here. <laughs> Smoother. And at that point, I was like, I said in the emergency button, I was like, if you don't stop, that man over there is the second best boxer in the Philippines. He's going he's to knock you out. He's going to knock you out. Guys, I'm not the second best boxer. I'm not. I was, I was leaving hospital and, um, oh, just before I left, uh, the day I was leaving, I was feeling pretty good about myself, just sort of dandering about the hospital for a uh, bit of a walk. And um, I was, went to one of the vending machines and the doctor who had taken my appendix out, who'd done that operation, was at the vending machine in front of me. And he was like fumbling a bit of money and stuff. He was clearly like a bit stressed in between shifts or whatever. I hadn't seen him since that operation. He wasn't like my doctor. So I thought, maybe show him there's no hard feelings here. It'd be a great opportunity to, to do that in the middle of his very stressful shift. So I sort of like knelt down behind him and just hit him with it. I was like... Uh, you'll probably uh, take too much stuff out of this that you don't need. Because you, you enjoy removing things unnecessarily, am I right? Don't worry about it. And he'd definitely forgotten who I was. Like, by that, like he does that operation like, a couple of times a day. It had been like two weeks ago. He definitely just thought a random one was calling him fat. He's like, I don't need this in, in, in my day. So I was, I was leaving hospital and feeling pretty good about myself, getting to go home. And uh, I was, I, like, there was like a lot of serious stuff happening on the ward that day. Like people were, were like on the way out and stuff. And I was just like walking near them and going up to the, beside the doctors. And I was like, don't know if you guys know this, if you're just looking for a bit of uh, inspiration or whatever and at, at this time, but I actually nearly fainted a couple of weeks ago there. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it, but <laughs> live strong. And I was, I was on my way out and the nurse was like, Bye, Shane, all the best. And I was saying bye to all the nurses. Went up to the guy from the Philippines who at that point definitely thought I didn't think he was second best boxer in the Philippines. But I was like, leave with a bit of, leave with a question mark over it just to fuck with his head. So when, when I was leaving, I shook all their hands and when I got to him, I was like... <laughs> and he was like, oh, fuck this guy. <laughs> so so the, the main nurse was like, uh, okay, Shane, that's you. You can, uh, you, you can head off. Uh, but just to let you know, in about a week, we're going to send for you to go for a colonoscopy. Now, at that point in my life, I'd never heard the word colonoscopy. And the way she sent it, and because and I was so, like, hyped up, the way she said it, I thought it was, like, some sort of, like, maybe lads' adventure day voucher they gave you. <laughs> where you and all your mates could take your pick of, like, adventure sports. Just if you're good banter in hospital. I was, like, clearly, that's the reward for that. So I was, I was buzzing. I was, like, texting all my mates. I was, like, thanks a lot for that. Just being, like, lads, Saturday, clear the diaries. Colonoscopy. They're like, we're not going. One mate's like, yes, mate, where? <laughs> where? <laughs> so, <laughs> attending straight away. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I went to get the colonoscopy where they put the camera, um, and I was pretty, pretty nervous about it, but I had no reason to be nervous. It was like a junior doctor and a senior doctor, and the best thing happened to put me at ease. Luckily, um, I went to school with a junior female doctor, <laughs> so... Great to catch up in sort of ideal, ideal circumstances, really. She was like, are you doing comedy? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, are you, what about you, just sticking cameras up, up people's, people's asses? She was like, yeah. So, I don't know if you've ever had this done, but I was like lying on my side, and they were just about to put the camera in, and there's like a big TV screen in front of me that's off, and a nurse came over, and she was like, Shane, do you want us to put the TV on for you? And... No, you see, I, I, I got the wrong idea. I looked at my watch. I was, don't forget, I was half sedated, right? And it was like half ten in the morning. I was like, why, what are we thinking here, guys? Home's under the hammer? What are we... <laughs> a place down under? I didn't say that, a place down under one, because I was sedated, but if I wasn't, I probably would have thought of it. So I was like, what are we, what are we all 
decide, just go, just, just get guide on there and we'll pick. And she was like, she looked at me like I was weird. She went, no, it's so we can show you the footage from the camera that's in your anus. And I was like, all oh, right, fuck. <laughs> fuck me, right? Um, so I was like, nah, funny enough, I, I was like, I'll give that a miss. I'll give that a miss. Um, stick a box set on by all means, but I'm not, <laughs> I don't want to watch that. So the, uh, I, I went out like a light and, I, and after I got it done, the senior doctor, he came in to me and he was like, Shane, how was that for you? He, was, he wasn't like smoking. He was like, <laughs> did you love it? He was, like, uh, he was like, how was that? And I said, do you know what, doctor? It wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. It really wasn't. And I think the best thing about it is you had that hand holder there, like that woman there to hold your hand. That made me feel good. And he was like, I need to speak to you about that. <laughs> That's one of the, the anaesthetists. What had happened is I'm like lying on my side. An anaesthetist, I got told this after, obviously, an anaesthetist walked past. We brushed hands by mistake. I took this as an invitation <laughs> to very aggressively hold her hand and set her down in a seat in front of me for, oh yeah, a good 40 to 45 minutes, just kind of making a, a wide range of facial expressions at her. And, and as I was, as I was, as I was leaving, me and my daughter, me and my daughter are walking out of there, and I'm feeling like a bit violated and embarrassed. I just want to, I just want to get home. And um, I, 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 I get home, and uh, I say bye to the junior doctor I used to, I used to go to school with. And then I've forgotten about it. So about two weeks later, I've gone from my first night out since I've been ill with my friends. I'm unable to drink. I'm like, oh, maybe have a beer, and we go out, and it's a good night. And then it's a beer garden in city centre, right? So it's packed with people, and I see the junior female doctor that I went to school with. Now, this is primary school, so I haven't seen her since primary school, the colonoscopy. It's the only time I've seen her, right? So, so I'm like, well, I don't know her. We've no reason really to speak. Um, she, a bit like my cousin Helen's boyfriend, Danny, is a very sort of serious, quiet person, and she's there with her friends. So we kind of just acknowledge each other, and I'm like, fuck, imagine if she came over and just was like, all my mates, she's like, I had a camera up him and stuff, right? So I was like, but obviously that's not gonna happen. So. Me and my friends have a drink and it's a great night. I'm like, I'm back, I'm enjoying myself, I'm feeling good. And we're walking out. It's like 11 o'clock, I'm like ready to head off here. The best night. As I'm walking out, she's had about 98 Jaeger bombs by this point. <laughs> and she's sitting nearest the door and I'm walking out with like four mates. And all I hear is, Shane, hey, hey. And I was like, hi, yeah, how are you? Just trying to like get my mates coats and like get us out. And she just called after me, she went, listen, I know you didn't want to watch the camera footage, but uh, I put it on a USB stick for you and you can stick that on your YouTube channel. <laughs> You'll probably get more hits. What? <laughs> See you later. See you later. And I was like, sometimes even as a comedian, you've just got to go, I've got no comeback for that. Like I can't. <laughs> or you can do what I did, which is report her to the NHS the next Monday and be like, <laughs> doctor patient confidentiality. And uh, she's got three kids, so it's a double victory because she will struggle. Like she will really... <laughs> really, really struggle, so I don't know. Hey guys, I was just wondering if, uh, speaking like medical procedures, did this thing ever happen? Like, I uh, hope it wasn't just me, like, but as a kid, if you had like a wobbly tooth, did, did your dad ever like tie a bit of string around your tooth, tie the other end of the string to a doorknob, go over to the doorknob, close it, walk down the stairs, get in his car and leave you and your family? <laughs> That's me. That's not true. It's not true. Um, <laughs> classic. I, um, I, it's my, my brother. <laughs> uh, I know, he's, he's our dad. <laughs> so, um, so I'm just going to talk a, a, bit, a bit about my dad, just give you an idea. My dad, he's, uh, he's in like his mid 60s and he's sort of like very like headstrong, just sort of does things a bit off center now, right? The best example of this is. Uh, he's taking me to a gig a couple of months ago and um, I'm in the car with like a few of my mates, he's giving us all a lift and I was like, they've never met my dad before, hopefully they get a good impression of him and we're at like a junction and it was a point where my dad should let loads of other cars out, can't remember what was happening with the lights but in any situation anybody would let wave, wave some cars out but my dad didn't and he just drove out and waited and I was like, dad, like, you, can't, you can't do that and my dad just straight looking at the road said this like it justified everything, he went there uh, well, I wouldn't want to let out a paedophile. <laughs> and I was like, 
what did you just say? And he was like, yeah, how do I know the fella driving that car is not a pedophile? I don't, want, I don't want anyone saying I was doing him a favor. And I was like, if anything, you've, you've, you've only delayed, all you've done is de delay him by a couple of seconds to get where he, if anything, you're giving him more time to think of what he's gonna do, like you're, you're helping a plan essentially, you're an accessory. But um, my, uh, I, get on, I get on really well with my dad, right? And uh, I'm 27 and I'm at that sort of age where my dad's not really ready to accept me as a man yet, but I'm hoping he does. And the best example of this is, my car was due for MOT recently, and my dad uh, was with me when I got the letter out, and I was like, I've got to go and get the MOT here. And my dad was like, whoa, 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 not without me, you don't. And I was like, I'm 27, I can drive through the MOT, I've done it before. And my dad went, trust me, you need me, because I know lads. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know what that means, but just come, just, <laughs> just, just come with me. So he, uh, he, he, he came with me and uh, the letter said like lane four, two o'clock or whatever. And I said to my dad, I was like, gotta go into lane four here. And my dad puts his hand on the steering wheel and went, lane four? Go into lane three, mate. <laughs> and I was like, nah, this letter definitely says <laughs> lane four. And my dad went, aye, but I know lads. And I was like, you can't start a ca catchphrase at 66. Like you can't, you're not the fawns, right? So, so I was like, I'll do what he says, I'll do what he says. My dad used to be a mechanic, he clearly knows a guy that works here. So I, I go into that lane, right? And um, I get to the mechanic, he, he waves me into the booth and uh, I put the window down and I say hello to the mechanic. And I'm waiting for my dad to take over at this point because he, he apparently knows this guy, he, my dad knows lads, right? So I, I turn around and I realize that my dad hasn't said anything. So I'm like, why is he not saying hello if he knows him? And the mechanic's not saying anything to my dad either. So I, I turn around to my dad and I realize that just because he's not, it's me that's stupid, like just because he's not saying anything doesn't mean he's not communicating with him. What he's doing is giving him the Northern Irish dad look of acknowledgement to other Northern Irish dads in a dodgy situation that basically says like, you know what's happening here? The look, your dad might have a slightly different variation, but my dad's involves the eye and the tongue. It's quite a common one. I'm 27, I don't know if I can do it perfect, but it's, it's a bit something like this. My dad was looking at the guy like this just to tell him like, we all know what's happening here. I look over, the mechanics just hit, same age as my dad, just hitting him almost straight back. <laughs> but half an hour later, I was like, I'm just in between two middle-aged men winking at each other with, with, their, with their tongues out. And then after a while, it was like a National Geographic mating thing. Like the boat just, they dropped the eyes, which just went to tongues after a while, just two men just. <laughs> and I was like, lads, what do you say? We'll, we'll do this test. And, the mechanic was, my dad described him as a bit of a character, which when your dad says that means convicted criminal. It means, <laughs> it means like this guy's been inside for a long time, like a real, <laughs> a murderer is what he means, right? When he's like, bit of a character, right? He's killed people. So this character is like, uh, he goes, right, Shane, uh, I know I know your dad here, but uh, I'm going to do this test by the book. We're not going to be cutting any corners, mate. All right? <laughs> Throws the elbow. You know he's being extra dodgy. Look. <laughs> so, my MOT consisted of, and if you don't know what the MOT is, where mechanics test your car to make sure that it's safe for another 12 months on the road. That's what he did for my MOT. Just sort of side, make sure nobody's watching, sidles up to it and just taps the side of one of the back doors. And he went, send it home, mate, that's you, get out, fuck off. <laughs> really aggressive for no reason, send it through, mate, fuck off, get out, <laughs> fuck off. Get out of my face, right? So uh, we drive through the bit where they're printing out your certificate so you can put it on your car and say this car's roadworthy. And I remember panicking at that point and being like, I'm not gonna have to pay for a retest, this is great. But I said to my dad, I was like, while we're here, could he, could he maybe just check the, the brakes? Like, cause <laughs> it's me that's gonna be driving it just so I know they work, and my dad's like, fuck, you don't, you don't know lads. Lads, <laughs> lads don't do that. I was, lads don't do brakes, no, great, great stuff. And <laughs> lads, and I, was, I remember driving out of the MOT center that day thinking like, if my brakes fail and I go off the edge of a cliff and die, like I won't have that beautiful moment of my whole life flashing for me before I die. I'll just have the look of what I saw when I looked in the rear view mirror that day, which was that mechanic about a quarter of a mile away in the distance, cleaning a spanner, still looking at me just,
Um, but that, I mean, like all, all dads kind of do that. I mean, even like, it's even to the point where like, because it's like a bit of banter as well, it's a point where sort of like, even Jerry Adams now is at the point where they're like, they're like, Mr. Adams, look, can you honestly say that at no point you remember if the Irish Republican Army? He's up on a podium at Stormont and he's so sick answering the question. They're like, Mr. Adams, are you denying that? <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll leave you with this, right? Being from, uh, being from Northern Ireland, like whenever you say you're from Northern Ireland when you're in, in different places, people are always keen to chat about the Titanic. They always say to me, Shane, Tell us, a, tell us a tale about the, the Titanic. And because, like, obviously, it was built, like, we built it, and we sell, obviously we, sell, we want to celebrate that fact, uh, or atrocity, um, <laughs> whatever, whatever you want to call it. So, so whenever people say I'm in America, whatever, and somebody's like, tell me a bit about it, I go, well, to be honest, and this is what I'll tell you, like, anything I've learned from Titanic is anything I've seen in the documentary that came out in cinemas when I was, like, 12. <laughs> Ta Titanic, which... which for 1914, the footage was absolutely incredible. Like, let me just say, I think I've got the facts right. I, I mean, if you ask me after that film making went backwards for a long, a long time, and then maybe water in the camera, I don't know what the problem was, but it basically focuses on, and hopefully you, you kind of learn something here as well as, as well as laughing, but um, it focuses on a man and woman, the documentary, and uh, there's a bit where, uh, by the way, I don't want to spoil it for you if you haven't seen it, but think, Things don't go well, let's just say. <laughs> it's not an ideal end of the holiday, right? So, there's a bit where, there's a bit where the man and the, the woman are in, in the water together, right? The documentary's been following them. And they're not like, yes, yes, they are on their holidays, but not, they're, not, they're not enjoying it, right? They're in, they're there by, by necessity, right? They're in the water. And, and she's like, You've, you've followed her whole family and stuff. It's like, it's like a, it was like an older keeping up with the Kardashians. And he's like, the man in it, he's like Kanye, he's like trying to be me, and they're like, they're not sure, right? But he's, he's dead on, right? She's a bit of a dick, right? Let's just, I'll take you up to there, right? So fast forward, they're in the water together. And this is like the main bit in the documentary, right? Where they're in the water and she goes, here, get me a raft, I'm freezing here. And he's like, He's like, yep, no problem. He's, as I say, he's a great guy. So he swims off a bit. It captures this really, really well. So I don't know why they didn't get into the boat that the film crew were on. But um, <laughs> yeah, she, he, 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 sw he swims off, right? And then he comes back seconds later and he, he pushes a bit of wood towards her. And he's like, there you go. And she, for someone who's been nearly dead at this point, leaps out of the water like a salmon. Like she, her, her whole body, like she... She's like a salmon upstream. She's like, you can't even see her in the distance and she lands perfectly on it, on her side. Just so, such a chill going. She's just like, and then when she's safely on it, she's like, did I not say a raft? I didn't say just a wee plank of wood, but fair, no, cheers anyway. And um, he's like, oh, best I could do. And then at that point of the documentary, he goes to like, he goes to get on as well because he sees she's safe and he's like, oh, brilliant. And he goes to get on. She's like, whoa. Whoa, relax for a wee second there. Um, she's like, hold on, I'm just doing some sort of calculations here. Um, I think this is only maybe, I don't know if we're going to get to on this specific raft. And he's like, but you're, you're like walking around it and stuff. And she's like, yeah, it's physics. She's like, it's physics. I don't know if. And then people are going past on, on like lifeboats being like, no, you could definitely get, you get at least six on, on that. Like if you... Even if you lie horizontally, like, and just rest your tummy and then kick, he could get on the other side. And she's like, yeah, don't think anyone asked you, though, so how's that? How's that? Go fuck yourself. She's like, what? She's like, what, what were you saying? Because at this point, he gets really, like, emotional, and she's, like, she's not that sensitive. She's, like, he's freezing. Like, his, he's gone, like, kind of blue a wee bit. And she, like, she's taken off a jacket at this point. She's too, like, if anything, she's... At this point, she goes into holiday mode. She's like shouting to people on other boats. She's like, guys, does anybody know what time we're getting into New York at tonight? Like, are we still on for? <laughs> and and, <laughs> and um, there's a bit where he says, like, oh, I want to tell you something. I want to get emotional for a second. She, she leans down and 
He goes, I just want to tell you how much you, and then uh, a bit out of order, like she starts splashing him a bit, and he's like, <laughs> he's like, oh, that is so cold. He's like, oh, please, please don't do that. She's like, fuck off, you're on the holidays. Enjoy yourself. Enjoy yourself. And um, she's like, you booked it. And um, in, all, in all seriousness, he says, he says, look, will you, will, will you hold my hand here? And she goes to lean down, and at this point, like, he's gone blue, and his hand, like, is, he's just got a wee tiny hand. That, like, it's, he's so cold that it's like a wee blue um, puppet's hand. Like, he's got a wee, his head's still the normal size, but he's just got a wee, it's like a wee action man's, it's really weird because his head's the same size, but it's like a wee blue claw, like a wee, like his, his whole, his whole, his whole arms, that, that's, that's the arm, that's not even the hand, which is even smaller again. It's just like a wee bright blue, 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 yeah. It's just like a wee, a wee, head's a normal size. She thinks it's a finger at first, and he's like, He's like, no, that's, that's, he's like, that's my whole arm. And um, she, she, she reaches down and, and he's like, hold my hand. And she goes to reach down and then she sees it. She's like, yeah, what's that? <laughs> and, and he's like, oh, just grab it anyway there. And, and she like, she grabs it. And um, no, it's, that, it's probably the most emotional bit. And I was 12 and I watched this and the emotional impact did, did hit me. She looks into his eyes, he looks into her, and, and, and he says how much he loves her, and she does get serious, and, and he's just bobbing over the edge there. Kind of, it, it's sort of the same as, but not as funny as, you know in the episode of Mr. Bean, where he goes to go off the edge of the diving board, but then he stops, you know, he stops himself, and he's like, making all the, he's, it's not as, he's, he's not making the, it's not as funny as that, but he's sort of just clinging on by his wee, wee, tiny, bright, blue toy hand, and, um, and and this is the, this is a bit, guys. Hope as I say, hope you maybe you didn't maybe you didn't even see this bit. But she she says to him, "I'll never let you go." And then in the same sentence, proceeds to quite literally just <laughs> just lets him she lets him go, and she's like she's like, "Oh, that's a shame." That is a. <laughs> and then people are like. Oh my God, he swam back up. He swam back up. He must really love you. And she sees it and freaks out. She's like, no. <laughs> and I just think that, I mean, I just think, you know, that would have been it. Like you, I sort of thought, well, that's the end of it. But what sort of I'm here to tell you, what you might not know is the story didn't end there for that guy. Because like clearly that documentary was so good that I think it was about six months later, he actually washed up on a, on a beach, it was the documentary, the, the Beach. And since they like they met him there, they got him coming out. And since then, like they followed him for his whole life basically in loads of different stories and they've they've got him in different places. And she does it as well. Like she's doing the documentaries as well. She's got she's called Kate Winslet and they hooked up and did one together, they met up again, and it was called Revolutionary Road, and she didn't like face charges for what happened, and <laughs> I, I just think that says a lot about Leonardo DiCaprio as a man, that he was willing to let bygones be bygones, and just, you know, meet up with her again, and professionally work with her, and there's actually a, a scene in Wolf of Wall Street, which is one he's in, and he's like got a great job now, despite everything that's happened to him, <laughs> he's making money, right, and all his... In it, right? Let's be serious for a second, right? All, all, all his mates, he, he's throwing the party, right? And he's got a swimming pool and all his mates are in there having a bit of crack, messing about in the water. And he's like just chilling at the side, having a drink. And then, out of nowhere, as a surprise to everyone, he does like a big cannon bomb, like a big funny cannon bomb into the water. And my mind blew. It was like, I was thinking the same thing his friends would have been thinking. Like if he, if he didn't want it, if he wasn't comfortable doing that, you would totally understand. Like you would... With, with everything he's been through, but he just, I don't know, he just thought he doesn't want his friends to, you know, not enjoy themselves any less. And I just think that that night would have been so different in the water that time if, uh, you know, if, if my dad had been going past on a lifeboat. Like, as soon as, as soon as Leonardo DiCaprio went under the water, my dad would have just, like, leant over the side of his rescue boat and pulled them out and just younger, stronger, just tried to get him back. And then people would be like, sir, are you sure you're qualified to be doing that? And my dad would be like, 
Yes, of course I'm a qualified doctor. <laughs> Guys, this has been uh, absolutely brilliant. Thanks. Uh, thanks. When we uh, when we when we when we booked this gig, like we had no idea that it would uh, that it would sell out. Um, but no, that's not. No, we had. We had, we, had, we had no idea because we, we did some smaller shows and this is far bigger than we just like took a chance on a really big show and this has genuinely been probably the best night of my life. Uh, thank you so, so much for coming out. I want you to give it up for uh, Dave Elliott and Alan Irwin that you saw, first of all. Everyone got to the speakeasy. I'm Shane Todd. Thank you so much for coming out to the show. I know nobody asked for an I'm just taking a photo. I know nobody, <laughs> no, we don't want an encore, mate. We've got to get home here. Um, <laughs> let me just take, everyone say cheese. Hey. Um, enjoy the rest of your night, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, this has really been incredible. Thanks a lot.